on with the podcast. A bit of lunch in here after. This way. Yeah, that way. All right, mate. How are you, mate? How are you? Good to see you, all right? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for doing this. No worries. Still ain't got a clue what I'm doing, but it seems to be going well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And everyone seems to be saying yes. Yeah. Come on. Well, that's what they said to me. Do you want to do this thing with Eddie? And I was like, what the fuck does he know about Eddie? Exactly. And they said, actually, he's number one on iTunes. I, I was like, well, hello, hang on a minute. <laughs> I was at Ascot yesterday, mate. If I get another question about Anthony Joshua. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, well, it was, it was a, oh, it was a huge right. shock, though, wasn't right. it? It was like, I didn't even bother. What I got up the next morning, and as I was eating my breakfast, it didn't come on the news, and I was like, fucking oh. hell. <laughs> I was standing in the betting line yesterday at Ascot, and this bloke's talking to me about Anthony Joshua and his wife goes, she was like a horsey lady. Mm. Not in looks, but in right. terms of her, what, <laughs> right. what she liked. So she's like, she goes, uh, can I ask you a question? Was that staged? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean was it staged? Well, was you know it, what, though? It could be the best thing that ever happens I know, no, I think so, because yeah, at the end of the day, I wouldn't say he never takes anything for granted. Mm. Because he works very, very hard. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah, mindset-wise, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he had the same mindset that he had when he was fighting Klitschko, for example, when it was do or die yeah it was just everyone's saying you're going to deal with this fat guy easy yeah then you're going to fight wilder yeah it's so good. It's, it's, it can be a good thing when you go punch mm. on the fucking nose yeah. once in a while it can be a good thing and actually the american experience i mean i remember when you've done you were there with ricky a couple of times it is a great bus brilliant. over there brilliant it's the best well ricky's a different thing altogether because yeah. it's, yeah. it's like joining the circus but Rick, ricky was like the difference with ricky why he was a one-off I mean, the support in terms of the numbers are quite similar, but right. Joshua appeals to, like, everyone. Yeah. Grandmas, kids. I mean, it's yeah, the first yeah, time yeah. where there's a boxer where kids in school are going, I want to be like Anthony yeah, Joshua. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ricky was just in the man of the people. Yeah. I mean, he was in the pubs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. Like, I mean... <laughs> I've never seen coming out of the ring when he fought, I can't remember who it was, he's got a kid... Uh, pouring a can of Guinness, I, literally <laughs> as he's in the corridor doing the thing, and... Uh, and then he had to go and do a, he had to go and do his drug test, and yeah. it was it was he was proper put out. And I've seen him drink Guinness with boxing gloves on after fights, it's just like you know, like a baby. Oh. And, it's uh, like the footballers as well. Yeah. You talk to like what we had some. We used to do a lot of poker stuff, and like Norman Whiteside would, would come and play the poker, and he'd right. tell us stories about Brian Robson yeah, yeah, yeah. and Paul McGrath, and that that culture. Well, back it's then like, well, we, we, I sort of say like this is like you know, Ricky got beat by two of the greatest athletes mm. of all time. Mm. I mean, the best will in the world, Ricky's not an athlete. <laughs> no. He's a brawler. Yeah. You know, and when you've seen him in the ring with, like, athletes, you just go, these guys have never touched a drop of alcohol, mm. far less been on the piss six weeks ago, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So, you know, but that's why people love him. Does, it, do. work, does it work that way in your industry? Like, as you get old, I mean, because... No, you're kind of required to cane it in the music yeah. business. <laughs> but as you get older, like, the... the I don't think the lens, the lens, sort of, has changed between now. Health is huge, right? I'm yeah. talking about in general. So I yeah. think, I think kids growing up, less people are smoking, yeah. less people are drinking heavily. Yeah. I think more people are taking well, drugs. We, by we, the way, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I think there is that more totally. gym, healthy yeah. eating. I mean, yeah, I remember when I went solo, what, ten years ago, walking in a dressing room and saying. What's that thing down the end of the thing there beside the bottle of whiskey? It's like, oh, that's a neutral bullet. <laughs> and I was like, fucking all that. And they're like, oh, you put stuff in it and blend it. I was like, like what? And they're it's for juicing. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and the juices are not. So I've got a vegan in the band. Yeah. They can't eat anything. Does that take the edge away? When we talk about Joshua, like you take the rawness away. Yeah. Like the rawness of probably. You in the early days mm. with Oasis was basically you were just all having a laugh. You used to turn up and get smashed yeah, and just yeah, yeah. have an amazing time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no, but you you get you get older and wiser, and you can't. I always say to people now, it's like you can't behave when you're in your fifties. You can't behave like you were when you're no. twenty-four. It's physically impossible. Mm. I was in Dublin last Sunday and was in the bar at, still at seven o'clock on Monday morning, and I'm still feeling it today. Mm. Like yesterday, I, I was as hungover. And it was on a Thursday as I'd ever been. And this was from Sunday night. Mm. And uh, and back in the nineties, we used to do we used to do that every night. Mm. I'm not even joking. Every night we got to bed at eight in the morning, do the gig the next day, forty thousand people, wouldn't think anything of it. If I had to do a gig tonight, I'd be sweating. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's just as you your body can't take it anymore. Mm. Mm. As you get older, that's it.
on this page they gave me. We've started now, by the oh, way. Okay. We, just, we, don't, we don't even have a start and a finish. We just talk. When you're right. bored, you go. Right. That's how it works here. Well, one thing reading through, I got I got this and, and another colleague of mine sent me some stuff, which I, one thing that stood out, found really interesting, was that your mantra, your mindset is about living each day in the moment mm. and actually yeah. a day at a time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a massive believer in that as yeah. well of keeping life simple yeah. I just, to keep yourself sane yep. because you live in a crazy world I mean your world's probably not as crazy as it once was but I just think that living in well I, the, do, I, 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 I do think people in all walks of life tend to overthink things mm, too much agree more. anyway I, I I live in the moment I mean I talk to people and they've got I've got to say it's mainly girls who girls always have a five year plan for themselves yeah, yeah. in five years I want to be I want to I want to look like this I want to be here and I want to have met that guy it's like five years mm -hmm. in five years who know I can't even think five weeks in front mm -hmm. I've got an office of people who plan you know they'll send me emails saying this is your schedule for August the 19th and then when you kind of get a phone call saying you're supposed to be somewhere half an hour ago, you say, well, nobody told me. And I sent you an email four months ago. It's like, what did you tell me four months ago for? <laughs> Remind me the night before. But I, I, I tend not to overthink anything, not artistically, not, not anything in my life. I mean, it changes when you have children, because then you mm. could never get the kids getting older and all that. But for me personally, thinking about things it won't do you any good. You know, you kind of focus on what's in the here and now, and then let the future will take care of itself. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't believe in overthinking anything. Do it, do it. Worry about it later. Mm. You know, and then and there's things that I've done in the spur of the moment where I've thought afterwards, oh, that was a bit shit. Or oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or oh, I shouldn't have said that. But I think if you're living in a moment, you're coming from a place of truth, mm. and you, and it's instinct, and and that's what it is. And I, I don't. Thinking about things takes too much energy mm. anyway. I think. Talk about life growing up for you. This is uh, a lot of these podcasts are basically me just interested in right. your life and right. finding out what, what you've done. What was life growing up for you? I've, I've read the research, but I want to hear it from you. I mean, how does a, a young kid from a Manchester council estate mm. become a rock star? How does a young kid forget where they're from, forget what kind of background they've gone, go on and, and end up becoming a successful few in the music business? Um, well, growing up was, it was the same as everybody else on our estate. It wasn't, you know, everyone at some point was on the dole. I left school in 1983, so there was a point in the mid to late 80s where not only me and all my friends were on the dole, but their dads were on the dole too. Mm. So you'd go and sign on and you'd be going to sign on with your dad, which is... At the time, you didn't think anything of it, but, you know, people make gritty dramas about that kind of <laughs> shit, you know what I mean? No, yeah. But at the time, we didn't think anything of it. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and it was way more sexist than it is now, way more misogynistic. Mm. Men were men. Men were violent, you know what I mean? The unemployment. Um, it's only looking back on it that you think... I mean, I, I, I never thought it was difficult at all, do you know what I mean? You were just living your life day by day, and I was obsessed with music and Top of the Pops and all that kind of thing. I never used to look in the mirror with a tennis racket and think, oh, I want to be on Top of the Pops like Mark Boland. That, to me, that was just a thought that never occurred to me until Liam asked me to join his shitty little band. You know what I mean? It was just like, it never occurred to me. And... Um, so I never had huge, great, big dreams. Of so he had the band. Well, he, 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 <laughs> growing up, I was always into music and clothes and all that. I was going to gigs. I thought that my destiny somehow lay in music, but I didn't know what it was. I couldn't play an instrument at the time. I could play, but it wasn't really any good. Then I met a guy by chance at a Stone Roses gig, very early Stone Roses gig. And uh, I ended up being a roadie for his band and they became successful. So I ended up traveling the world and I thought, oh, this is it. Mm. This is great. I was getting like a few hundred quid a week, all the crisps you could eat, drugs, <laughs> everything. Didn't have to do any interviews. Nobody knew who I was. This is great. I was on tour in Germany, I was in Munich, and I called home. And I was talking to my mum about whatever, and I said, I was the other fella. And she said, Oh, he's out rehearsing. And I was like, What? He's not joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, surely. <laughs> she said, No, he's in a band. And I was like, He's in a band? And she said, Yeah. And I said, Doing what? She went, He's a singer. I went, He's a singer. So I got back to Manchester after a, a month or two. And uh, they had a gig and I went to see them and they were all right. And then they initially asked me to manage them. And I was like, what? And uh, I went down to chat with them in rehearsals and they said, do you want to join or what? And I was, yeah, all right. And that was it. And it kind of went from there. And uh, it was only really, even then, it was only really, because I was still a roadie at the time, it was only as a laugh with something to do. 
wasn't really until I wrote Live Forever that I thought, hang on a minute, there's something in this. You know, this is a great fucking song. And uh, it was only then that I started to take a step back and think, right, you might have a shot at getting a big telly in a massive house. <laughs> what, what, what was the passion? Obviously, the passion for music was very strong mm -hmm. for you, but what was it about music? Some people obviously want to become footballers. We talk about how boxing can change people's lives. I'm a big advocate of what it can do for your respect, discipline, mm -hmm. and, but what was it about music that... Well, I, I mean, I, look, I'm a fan of music first and foremost, which is why I'm still fascinated by it after all these years. I still love what I do. Uh, um, music is one of the most important things in life. It's the, it's the universal language of the world, you know what I mean? People, I, my songs, now I go to South Korea, you know what I mean? The kids are mm. like in tears at songs that I wrote when they were all at nurseries, you know what I mean? Work that one out, I don't, you know. But music has always been everything to me, it's always there. You know, it, it always made me feel good. The characters in music, when you've seen them interviewed, like the Beatles and the Stones and the Sex mm. Pistols and Weller and all that, they were always like, oh, they're fucking cool, man, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. Like the clothes they're wearing and all that. And, um, you know, to be able to play music, regardless of the success and all that, it's a privilege in itself. I could say it, uh, Is that why you still do it? Yeah. Because, like, you talk about an age, you don't need to be no. out there touring, playing music. No. It's just a pure love for yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Love I love it. I'm do. obsessed with it. It is, you know... Rock stars of my age have usually got at least two hobbies. Like, a, you know, I, I, I've never had a driving license. I'm not into cars. No, I read that. I'm not into. I'm You've not, never driven. No, I'm not into collecting art. No, never, never. And I've got a hundred and ten thousand pound Jag set in a garage that I had built for me <laughs> on the premise that I was going to learn to drive one day. God damn it! But my my hobby is what I do. You know, I drive my missus up the wall. You know, I'll get back after being away for seven weeks on tour. And I'll get in and, you know, she'll find me in the morning playing the guitar at 7 o'clock mm. in the morning. She'll be like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, God, I've got an idea for this. I've just been on the road for seven weeks. Mm. You, you know, how about playing football in the garden with the kids? Like, ah, they'll be all right, they'll be all right. When, um, you, when you talk about touring, that must be... Because I think when you talk about the highs of an athlete or a, an artist or mm. a performer, we talk about, I mean, you were there walking Ricky Hatton out, mm. that ring walk, mm. you know, that moment you come through the players' tunnel at Wembley, yep. that moment you come out to play a gig in front of yeah. 50,000 people. Well, talk I, us through that. I yeah. mean, what, well, what I, is that like backstage? Well, it's funny that when you see a lot, when you meet a lot of sportsmen, they're always like, oh, what's it like on stage? It must be amazing. It's like, but it's the same as you. You're performing, mm. although you're in a sporting contest, if you're a boxy with another guy and it's a bit more intense, or if you're in a football team, the only difference is... I guess with footballers, is you're representing the fans. And if you get it wrong, mm. they're on you. We're representing us, you know, and we're kind of required to be a bit sloppy mm. and a bit lippy, you know what I mean? Uh, and not too professional. But it's still performing at the end of the day. And I look at footballers and boxers and snooker players and tennis players and just think, how can you, that would be too intense for me. Yeah, they, when you meet they them, do, they, they, do. they just go, wow. They, I, I, a lot I, I, of people, they, they say, like, yeah. that's the ultimate. Yeah. You know, to get out there and perform in front yeah. of a crowd. Like, well, it's, it's like, I mean, I've, as you may be aware, I've taken a lot of drugs in my life, and that, that one, when you walk out on stage, is the best of them all. Mm. There's nothing quite like... You can, you can be still on the side of the stage feeling really pretty fucking bad. You might have flu or a cold or anything. Once adrenaline kicks in... It's all gone. When you, when you talk about the drugs, is it that it's just a process of the industry you're in? Is it something that is almost, like in a, in a, in a, in a way, required to perform? Well, I mean, to the, I don't, I don't I mean look, at, look at darts players, right? I know this is right. well off field. Right, 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 right. There is a drinking culture in darts mm. that means that every darts, I mean, we're doing the darts now. You're talking about 10, 12, 15,000 crowd. Mm. You're up there throwing a little ball mm. and you've got 15,000 piss people <laughs> behind going, oh, <laughs> yeah. like, right? yeah. a lot of them have a drink before they go out. And it's yeah. just like the standard industry yeah, yeah, norm yeah. where it's like a numbing effect yeah. where you're going out yeah. to, to basically perform. Well, like, yeah, well, I mean, all the great artists that we can think of, they weren't making all those great records on orange juice and fucking <laughs> cigarettes, you know what I mean? The Beatles weren't sat around drinking tea all day. But I will say, I was taking drugs long before I was in the music business. Mm. It was just part of Manchester street culture growing up, that's the way it was. But you get more access to it in the music, or you did then in the music business. And the, the trick is, if you let 
the lifestyle overwhelm you and, and absorb you, you're fucked. I'm lucky in a way and the, I could just take it or leave it. Mm. I could properly get stuck in mm. and then walk away from it. You know? um, to me, I've always worked backwards from the work. If the work was suffering, I'd pack it in. You know, as, lo as long as I'm as long as I'm doing good work, then everything's all right. You know, and and you know, to be in the music business, particularly in the nineties, was like joining the circus. It was. Mm. I bet. It was. How old are you? I'm just turned forty. Right. So you were what? Twenty. You were, you were twenty. Yeah. Okay, well, teenage, I was growing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Music. I mean, it was. It was a great decade but to like be the young. Perception. Like I was probably. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, when you guys were, you know, and the perception was of you lot. He was like, these boys are fucking, they are at, yeah, absolutely yeah. smashing it. You know, in every way, in yeah. every way, you know, and it was, but but in a way, that's kind of the image. When we talk about a, a promotional, you know, mm. side, and I always look at the music industry, because I often say to my old man, you know, we should be in music, you know. It's the same kind of things. Like, yeah. mate, I've heard about stories in yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a story to be made about you guys touring and the stories and the business itself. Because mm. I'm fascinated by the business. I'm sure you've had good tour promoters, bad tour promoters, and you yeah. you, look, you're, you know you now know the business inside out. Yeah. You may end up, yeah. probably don't want to do it, but well, being we, a guy who well, knows exactly how to manage, promote, and monetize a successful well, band. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm lucky in the fact that I've only ever had one manager. Right. And you put yourselves in his hands completely and there's never been any trouble with that, and he's, he's very straight up guy so he looks after all that I haven't got I haven't got a clue what's mm. I mean I know the ins and outs of it you know what I mean but you've got to trust the people that you surround yourself with but touring further afield can be a bit tricky there's always been offers to go to oh I'm going to play in India or you know, somewhere else, but you're just like you, you, have, you have to trust the people who've got instincts to just go hang on a minute this, yeah, this, this, this sounds right. a bit flaky yeah. music's a strange one in that obviously what we do in terms of sports TV and content you, you kind of know where it's being sold and you know and understand the audience ratings and you know where a fire to talk about Anthony Joshua yeah. and we might come back you know this market's increasing their spend mm. the ratings are really strong here in Germany and Spain mm. but music's something that just infiltrates naturally doesn't it yeah. like you, you say about Indonesia it yeah. must have been weird going up when you, when you go to tour when we first went to Japan and uh you know, it was looming. This six months, it's like we're going to go to Japan. We we're like, I can't believe we're going to get to go to Japan. Someone's going to pay us to go there. And we were the biggest thing in England at the time. Getting on the plane to Japan, I was thinking, well, it be like <laughs> be like getting a punch on the nose off to start again. When there was like the Beatles right, arriving, yeah. it was unbelievable. There were thousands and thousands of people at airports outside hotels. It was worse when we got there than it was in England. And this is, this is all before social media. So kind of now, with social media, you can control, you not control it, but you can kind of gauge what the reaction is going to be because you've got people, your digital experts mm, in the mm. office who know all this yeah, kind sure. of shit. Back in the 90s, you kind of threw it out there and yeah, just went, yeah. right, well, let's go and let's yeah. see what happens, you know, and, and you, you know. It's exciting, Yeah, I get the, the music business is forever changing. Mm. See, what you do is kind of, you know, there's two guys and there's a narrative mm. between the two guys. And if that, the narrative is good, and they could both sell it, you're onto a win like Frotch, yeah. um, Groves. Groves. Yeah. Couldn't have got a better mm. narrative than mm. that. And then some of them are bigger than others, and some of them are kind of, this guy's not really good at selling him, and that guy with the good fighters. You kind of know what you're getting into. Music, it's like, you know, you can put out one album one year, and then the next year, do the same album by the same guy writing the same songs, and it completely bombs. Mm. And you're just like, you scratch your head for years thinking, why is that? And it's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables and it's art and it's different and it, mm. and it, and it it's people in a different way. Like when it's a pay-per-view thing, mm. you know, Anthony Joshua Ruiz, that's not pay-per-view, mm. but the next one is. Yeah. The next one is. The next one is a must-see yeah, fight. Yeah. But the other one was, I'm not waiting up to four o'clock in the morning yeah. to see that. And yeah, thanks for that. It's, just, it's the same with... Uh, <laughs> Same with Tyson Fury's yeah. fights, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's, right, yeah. he's like the equivalent of parking the bus yeah. in a football match. He's like playing for the draw, seeing if you nick mm. it. I want to step to four o'clock and watch him. Mm. But when he fights Wilder, of course. or he fights AJ, uh, you're staying up, mm. you know? Mm. Um, so it depends on the on the two guys in the ring. Mm. You know? And from there, High Flying Birds, is, is that, did you ever feel that, because you didn't start Oasis, that this was something you wanted to do, create a band. I mean, I, I, I've only just learned from our conversations that you joined that band yeah, yeah, yeah. for Oasis. Yeah. High Flying Birds, different 
kettle of fish. Yeah, I don't. You know what it was? I I I left Oasis and then I didn't do anything for two years. And I, and I mean, I'm a songwriter by trade, and I I had loads of songs. And it was my missus who we were sat. I I was going to bed one night, not even remotely thinking. I had I didn't think in myself I'd retired. But I wasn't planning on doing anything. And it's my missus who said, she's just done that thing where she said, can I ask you a question? And I was like, go on. She said, what are you going to do? <laughs> and that signified to me that I'd been in the house too long. And, and I was like, uh, well, I don't know, I hadn't thought of it. And she's like, you should do something, though. Which really means is, I'm getting bored of you being around the house all day now. And then I woke up the next morning and I thought, right, well, I'll, I'll put a band together then. And it was just a slow process of doing that. And then I made a record, and the record was great. And if the record hadn't have been great, you know, I don't know whether I'd have put the band together and gone on tour. And then, you know, it was just a gradual thing. We did a couple of gigs, and then we did a couple of bigger gigs, and the next thing, selling out the old two, and it was like, all oh, right, well, this is taken off now. So there was just. Do you feel? Do you feel a lot more passionately about that group than you did about Oasis back in the day? No, exactly the same. The same. Oasis was my life. And this is my life now, and uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm older now, so I'm more considered about my approach to this, and I'm, I'm kind of in charge, and I'm the singer and all that. Whereas in, in, Oasis was all about the struggle. It was about the struggle from growing up to getting there, and then the struggle staying there when everybody's pulling in a different direction, and, it's, and you kind of got to make it work. This is just serene and it's like you know I've managed to get a load of people who are all on the same page you know everybody's pulling in the same direction although I've got three girls in the band and that is a fucking minefield <laughs> oh my god it's insane in what way oh three girls in a band two of them fucking French fuck no they don't give a fuck <laughs> fucking I've never seen so many cigarettes in my fucking life <laughs> With the change in culture, you were saying about you know you can create one thing one year and then yeah, the yeah. next year and no one's interested. Yeah. Do you have to think about that when you're making music, or is it just because you can be stubborn, can't you, and say mm. no, no, I only do what I like? Yeah. But at the end of the day, you got you got to create interest and you got to set albums. I think towards and when you talk about black star dancing. Mm, yeah, again, well, I will get completely to, yeah, yeah. different well, to in, your normal. In, what, one one of the reasons why. Uh, it wasn't that much of a struggle to leave Oasis was we'd allowed ourselves and I was as guilty of it as anyone of allowing ourselves to be dictated to by our audience they wanted stadium rock mm. right and we thought that was it and we were kind of giving them every time I would sit to write a record it was giving them what they wanted Towards the end of Oasis, I was like, this, this is, there's got to be more to that. I was getting restless and bored with, with the music. And now, I just trust my instincts. And if it sounds good to me, I've got by on... I pick all the singles in Oasis, and I've got by on my taste running that band for that year. So, more or less, I've got it right. So when I'm in the studio and I've come up with Black Star Dancing and I like it, I think, right, well, I know everyone's not going to like it, but perversely, part of me wants to put that out just to piss a few people off. Mm. And, um, and I think, well, if I like it, a healthy percentage of people are going to like it. And you've just got to trust your instincts. You know, you, you'll be the same with when things take off in the boxing world. Or, mm. You know, you're just... You, who'd have thought that first Frotch Groves fight, you know, would, you know, make the second one the thing that it was? It was supposed to be an easy fight. But, it was when, I remember seeing Carl Frotch, right, at the GQ Awards leading up to that fight, and I was saying, why are you fighting him? Mm. And he was like, oh, I don't know, you know, kind of thing. But then when they started doing the head-to-head -head yeah. things, it was like... Just chilled, just worked. Oh, and it was actually the hell. first guy who really got under his skin. Yeah. And he really did yeah. get and then when he done he, his head. And then he completely. put him on his ass uh -huh. in the, in the third, third round, round or whatever. First round, first round yeah. was just like, I remember at home going, fucking hell, it's on here, it's <laughs> on. Fuck. And... Uh, and then they got the second fight was just, you know, yeah. you just print tickets, yeah, don't you? Yeah. You could print tickets. But that, that was a similar thing where we talked about, I remember for the Wembley fight, I went to a few stadiums 
and then I went to Wembley and I walked out through the, the, the players tunnel and I was just thought I've got to do it here did you think you could do the 490? no because I spoke to my dad and I said dad I've just been to Wembley I said this is where we've got to do it and he's like son don't go mad once I did Eubank against Watson the first fight was controversial yeah. I did the second fight at White Hart Lane we sold 18,000 tickets and I, wow. I lost a load of money. Wow. He said, don't think this fight is bigger than it is. I said, and at that time, British boxing wasn't at a level that it is now. Yeah. You know, Joshua wasn't doing 80,000, 90,000 yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. This was like, no one had done more than 20,000. Yeah. And we just went in, the capacity is 80,000. I remember going on sale, just thinking, probably like how you felt when you went to Japan, thinking, oh, what's going to yeah. happen here? And it was just bang. And it was literally an hour yeah. before virtually the whole thing sold out. So and it was just, but you know, sometimes it's about creating those moments and those nights. Yeah. And I think, same same way with an Oasis gig, it was a must see event. Well, it didn't really matter where it was, how much it I, was, where you had to sit. It was just we had to be there. Yeah. And that's the key of any great event, isn't it? Where I, you, I I remember being taken to Nebworth on the way to a gig in Southampton. We were doing at Southampton, either Civic Hall or Guildhall. It was about eighteen hundred people, mm. right? And the, and on the way, they take me to Nebworth. And in the middle of this nothingness, might as well be in the middle of the desert, they were saying, so we're going to think of putting you on here. And I was like, where though? And they were saying, well, here. And I was saying, but where's the stage going to be? And they're going, well, it's going to be down there. And I was like, that's not even in the same county. What are you talking about? <laughs> and we kind of walked around and I was going to the promoter, who's been my promoter all my life, Simon Moran. I was like, mate, if you're daft enough to do it, right, I'm daft enough to turn up. And he said, we could do five nights here. And I was like, you fucking out of your mind. I've got to Southampton playing 1,500 people. You're talking about a quarter of a million people. He said, you can play to four or five million people if you want. And because you're in your little traveling bubble and there was no social media, you had no comprehension mm. of what it was on the outside. You were just in, you had like a core of like eight, nine, 12 friends and you all kind of hung out with each other and that was it. Um, How nice, by the way, is that world without social media? Brilliant. I mean, my old man says to now, he says, Oh, I'd hate to promote now. I said, boy, I said, we used to do a show. And I'd go, that was great. And then we'd go and get something to eat. And you'd be right. there with your mates going, what a great night. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. you do a show and it's like, you I want my money back. Yeah, You're yeah. a con man. <laughs> Fuck you, Hearn. No, but, and it's, but you can't Why do they always boo you oh, in the game? I don't know, I don't know where it, it comes from. Is it because you said the ticket price? Is it because you said the ticket price? Well, I have to go along with it now. And when I go to America, they go, hey, Hearns. They'll call me Eddie Hearns. I love it when they boo. Why'd they boo you, man? I'm like, oh, it's like a joke thing, you know, like it's just a really British thing, you know. But that world of social media, are you active on social media? No, not at all. No. No, I don't know. I was on, when it first, blew up um, I was on Instagram for about a year and then I was just bored of negativity no 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 I'm not no I don't, I don't read the comments it's just I did a world tour and it was oh, I'm a, quite a private person I'm mm. not interested in people seeing what socks I'm wearing <laughs> or like you know taking a photograph of a croissant and going fucking <laughs> breakfast anybody that's <laughs> fuck that. I don't want anybody to know anything about me yeah. at all I'm not interested in people seeing the real me. Fuck everybody else. I'm not interested. So when I got when I, was, I had an Instagram camera account, I was literally posting a picture of the Eiffel Tower saying, "Thanks for coming to the gig last night, guys," yeah. and say some shitty fucking yeah. thing in French. And that was all right for the first time I did it. When I did it the second time, I was like, "Nah, this is, this is boring now." And people were like, "Yeah, but you know, you like do other stuff." And I was like, "No, nah, I'm not. No, it's not for me. I'm not. You know." But what was that fame like, though, being in... I mean, obviously, now you've still got it, but those days, I mean, you wouldn't have been able to No, move. I couldn't go out. Uh, it, was a, it, wasn't, it wasn't an overnight thing, and it was a gradual thing, and it was something that I was prepared for. And I, I've never... Going back to what we said right at the beginning, I've never overthought any of it. I always thought at some point it would level out. You know, um, and when kids were hanging out outside my house in... Primrose Hill, uh, the, the, the neighbours complained about the litter, right? So the council put in two litter bins outside my house, but into the concrete, and they put a bench outside my house for kids to sit on. And there was never any point where there was less than 25, 30 people there. But I kind of loved it. If I'm in a bad mood and I'm in trying to buy underpants, and people are going, can I get a selfie? Just like, just, <laughs> just let's buy these first, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, Are you good like that? If you're a girl, you're going to get a picture, yeah. right? If you're a big idiot with an England top on saying, what are we making? Can I just get a quick picture? Just go, well, I don't know, can we? 
You know, do you know how to work that fucking thing you've got in your hand? And they're always <laughs> fannying about with it. And then they pass it to the mate who drops turn it, it around, and drops, and yeah, <laughs> and all that kind of shit. And uh, no, I try, I try and be as unapproachable as possible <laughs> because you literally, if you're walking up Oxford Street, and you, the key is not to stop. If you stop, you are fucked. Mm. Carry on walking, is carry on moving. And um, but if it's girls, it's kind of like, oh, right, fair enough. But mm. if it's a big fucking Jordan, it's just like, <laughs> fuck off, mate. <laughs> Ah, oh, weird man, I bought all your records. You're like, really? Well, nobody buys records yeah. anymore, so you've streamed them all, have you? Well, fucking good for you. Talking about streaming, well done for bringing us on to that. Mm. I'm, I'm probably classed as a younger promoter. I am 40. Mm. When right. you talk about the way people are digesting content now, I mean, now... Even that, even that phrase. Yeah. yeah. Digesting content. Yeah. Digesting content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it from a meeting earlier. <laughs> but, but are you on board with that, the way people are digesting content you now? Be. Because you talk about Top of the Pops days. It's, it's a completely different way... Uh, well, uh, do you know what? It's, 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 although nobody buys records in any significant quantities, a lot of people now, more people go to gigs mm. because there's so many kids at my gigs, like, and I mean children, who were... I, the, the, all the gigs I've done this year, I've looked out on the crowd every night, guys with their tops off, singing and crying at the same time, mm. and I'm thinking, mate, you, were, you must have been 10 when we broke up. Mm. far less when we were together and that's because they don't have to go and find your records they just whip out their phone and their older brother says you want to get to Oasis mate that's what you want me into and they just go oh, that's my dad's music they listen to it and they go actually fucking oh, that's alright so it's revolutionised the live scene but the, the, the flip side of that is tickets are now so expensive because records are free virtually almost mm. and you're not going to give up your lifestyle yeah. do you know what I mean but I was against it at first and I thought it was the enemy and I, I always like to own records and all that, but it's, it's such a big, it's just a big tidal wave now that you just got to get with it, you know what I mean? And that's it. And there's more, there's more stuff, there's more promo to do now for like, you know, you used to do a couple of interviews, in music magazines, one in the press and you'd be done. Now it's like you've got to do something for Spotify. Fucking Eddie Hearn wants a well, fucking job. Exactly. Fucking podcast. Like, you must Eddie be Hearn. Old if you Eddie Hearn wants a job. Fucking hell. <laughs> they got to do with music. Um, I, and, and there's like, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do this and you've got to spend five minutes doing that and then you need a picture for this. But you've just got to adapt. And, um, you know, there's not many you people... You more patience now for that. I well, mean, back, like, well, you've got, well, you've got to be... You've got to be into it and you've got to think, right, well, this is what I've got to do to remain doing what I'm doing, you know. And it's, it'd be easy enough just to be an old curmudgeon about it and go, I've had enough and, mm. and just go and retire and do, you know, six gigs every four years. But I fucking love what I do. Mm. I love what I do. And, um, do you think that's the same for other huge acts? I'm no, talking about like the Rolling Stones. What, what I mean... What, well, no, what, what, what do you think motivates the Rolling Stones? I mean, what, well, is it just purely money? Is it just no, they love? No, it can't be money. I know those guys. It cannot be money because they've got all the money in the world. They've got, they've been the, doing... So they've the been doing, touring, but don't they just, been, don't they travel like individually to yeah, gigs yeah. and like... They've what? been doing gigs, that, uh, tours that have grossed $500 million for the last 30 <laughs> years. They, they're not short of credit. They do it because they love it. Yeah. When you, I've speak to Keith Richards and Ronnie. Well, it's like to two teenagers mm. about guitars. Amazing, isn't it? Mick Jagger, if he's not Mick Jagger, what's he doing? He's the same as me. He doesn't drive. He can't swim. You know what I mean? He's 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 <laughs> he's, he's, he's Mick Jagger. He's going to be Mick Jagger till the day he, he dies. Um, Paul Weller, you know, he's obsessed with music mm. and where it's going and his own thing and all that. And I'm from that school where it's like, what else am I going to do? I can't do anything else. I don't, I'm not interested in anything else apart from Sarah, the kids, City, and music, and that's it. That's it, I'm not, I, don't, I don't care about anything else. I don't want to be an actor, I'm not asked about owning paintings, I don't, I don't really particularly into films or going out to the theatre. For someone, for someone that lives by the moment and day to day, is it, is it a silly question to ask you what the future holds for Noel Gallagher, well, High I, Flying Birds? I mean, is there... There a plan. I know you're not planning to. It's no, just. No, I know. I know. I'm on tour until November, and then I'm just building a recording studio. So I've got to get that up and running in 2020. And then once that's done, I'll make a record. But I'm, there's no hard and fast plans. You know, I've got to. Um, uh, kids are going to going to, well, going to move into new schools soon, so I've got a bit of family life going to take over for 2020, and which is great because I've done three years back to back now, so I spend a bit of time at home. But other than that, it's not, um, not, I don't make, 
plans will get fucked up really quickly in the modern world because you know you can start out on a cycle of making a record by the end of the time you've made the record made the record all the rules have become obsolete you know someone will send you into the studio and say we need 18 tracks we need 10 for an album we need two for spotify eddie Earn wants two for his podcast <laughs> you know oh, we'll asda asda want one you know by the time you get to finishing it you've done 18 tracks and they say yeah you know we don't need 18 now we just need six you know so you're just like well i think you told me four months ago and they're like yeah that's all changed eddie done eddie's not into music now <laughs> eddie's into jujitsu <laughs> Well, it sounds like High Flying Birds is the future for Noel Gallagher. But, mate, honestly, genuinely, I, I absolutely loved that. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you and very much, mate. I appreciate sitting down with us and talking with this crazy thing we've got going. I don't know where it's going. How many episodes have we got left? Five more. Five. Five. Have I got a new deal? I'm not, <laughs> seriously. Because when we talk about money... You want to start streaming it? You want to start streaming it? No, we're working on that. Mate, thanks for everything. I appreciate it. Come on.